Good day. This is uh, Philosophy Roulette number 94, where we uh, find some philosophy online and read it and review it. So, let's get going. If you have any suggestions out there on something I should read, please let me know. Otherwise, I just grab something off the internet, and that's why it's roulette. I don't know if it's any good or what it's going to be about. So... Although agriculture and human values, how do you publish this amount? It's crazy. Always with the agriculture and human values on fill papers. Sort of amazing. Uh, we did some bioethics uh, the other day. AI and society. I've done stuff from AI and society. So, let's take a look. Let's get the little... Uh, um... Oh, is this available? I want to find out what fubbing was. Qualitative study, study of fubbing. Hmm, maybe it's available now. fjmu.edu.china. Let's see. It's not open access. Come on, fjmu. So, we'll have to see if this loads, but otherwise. Social choice, ethics, and artificial intelligence. I think this uh, this uh, journal is one of the ones that has like two very teeny columns of font. So, unfortunately, the fact that all these things look short is uh, a little misleading. They're really twice as long because it's uh, twice as much uh, text per page. So if it's like 20, if it's like 15 pages, that's really like 30 pages. I'd be reading for two hours. It's like, ah, I can't do it. Well, are we loading or not? I don't know. Maybe, oh, we're bouncing off China. So, oh, look at this. I've got Chinese web VPN. Interesting. Maybe they, uh, so this may be the, uh, link that they give to the author sometimes. Uh, for, so the author can give out the uh, paper. All right, but let's just, okay. We've given you, you an opportunity. Let's see, invitation to critical. Oh, I read this one right here. This was, um. yeah, it, it turned out to be an editorial. Like, uh, I think this is the, uh, Professor Gill is the editor. So, but it was interesting because uh, Gill was uh, reviewing some sort of like the direction of the uh, journal the papers in that journal and it was uh, so it was an interesting read that uh about showing what they were talking about in that uh and that and that and that issue okay we did the bioethics yesterday axiomathes i like axiomathes it's just it's uh, it gets technical so I'll, we're not do that we did let's see critical eth clinical ethics i don't know what clinical ethics is let's go find that out that oh, let's see if the chat works Hello! Chat is working, okay. Once in a while it uh, breaks silently, so it looks like it's working, but it isn't. Iranian medical residence professionals, I'm a purist, and this looks like science-y stuff. I can't read science online because, well, I just can't, it doesn't work. Uh, okay, not opening. Let's try to retry. Yeah, because uh, the reading data online doesn't work, so. Another way to understand autonomy in psychiatry. Interesting. Uh, nope, not available. This isn't loading patience social choice and ethics and artificial intelligence okay so ai and society we might be bringing another one of these let's see how long is uh 17 pages single space yes here's the thing about the uh nope not happening right now because this would be close to at least an hour and 20 minutes of it uh that's too bad so maybe you have to uh, I'm going to upgrade my script so I'll get like less than 10 pages, less than 5 pages, less than 15 pages, and a lot of like color coding. 
Again, if anyone wants to send something in so I don't have to sit around and get roulette, I can have the roulette played for me by you sending it in. That's a lot easier for me, and I like that. <laughs> and I know at least one person will be interested. <laughs> that is one of the top uh, things I get from the, because I email the authors and they all say, oh, so exciting, at least somebody read my paper. <laughs> uh, academia. I don't know what any of this stuff is. Um, a toward moratorium on publishing the field of education studies. That's like saying you can't publish philosophy anymore. I mean, really, what else are you gonna do? It's like, there's too many papers, I can't read it. An epilogue to editing. Let's see, what, is this what I'm supposed to be reading? Yes. All right, full article. Um, editorial, okay. Okay, so this is, um, the editors are signing off. That's why it was short. Autonomy and psychiatry, is that what I wanted to get? Um, yeah, it wasn't there. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to, fuck, to uh, analysis at this point. I'm getting tired of looking. Let's see if analysis is anything new. Uh... Oopsie, banana, not banana. Yeah. Okay, let's go see. In our best defense, paternalism, a defense of paternalism. Oh, that sounds like fun. Okay, so this is new. Let's see if there's anything on the forthcoming list also. Jessica Begon. No, be available. Oh, okay, it was a review anyway. That's okay. Oh, I read most of these. <laughs> Accuracy, monism, and doxastic dominance are by Steinberg. Take a look. Literal self-deception. Did I read that one? <laughs> uh, did I? I think I read ways of thinking about ways of being. Let's see what else we got. Time biases on evidence in philosophy. Paradise engineering. Mm -hmm. A lot of erratum today. I wonder why people are messing up. what I like to see. Alright, let's just see if it's not, um, if it's too much, uh, logic. I can't read it, though. Uh, Deary. Yeah, it's a little bit tough. It's not that bad. Okay, so we're gonna read this one, unless one of these is so cool that I have to read that one. <coughs> Available. Okay, that makes it simple. So, if you join me live anytime and you want to grab the paper, and people do sometimes. They, I mean, grab the paper and also join me uh, while broadcasting. Um, you can do so by typing exclamation point paper in the chat box and the link will pop back up right over there. Okie dokies. 
Florian Steinberger has recently raised a problem for accuracy monists who think the sole epistemic good is accuracy. The sole epistemic good is accuracy. How do they square that? I mean, just being accurate about stuff? Wouldn't you want to know stuff? I mean, you could know one thing and be super accurate about it, but like that would be kind of terrible. All right, whatever. Central to Steinberger's complaint is that said monists lack the re well, I guess if they're monists, there is only one thing, and they just want to be accurate about it. Okay, yeah. Um, although it accurately monists. All right, whatever. Central to Steinberger's complaint is that said monists lack the resources to rule out a class of accuracy functions, which, when combined with typical dominance rules, will lead to troubling consequences. I reply on behalf of the monists that they can avoid Steinberger's problem by shifting to sub, sub, subtlety, sub, subtly different, I don't normally have to say subtly different, sub, subtly different dominance rules. I'll leave it. First, I'll briefly explain how the accuracy framework we're interested in works. Then I'll explain Steinberger's problem case and suggest that the core of Steinberger's objection differs slightly from its official statement. Lastly, I'll show how changing the dominance conditions can help us avoid the relevant unattractive consequences and briefly comment on the implications of this change. Accuracy, accuracy epistemologists claim that Ceteris Paribus, one's epistemic attitudes are better when they are in some sense closer to the truth than further away. While most accuracy epistemologists have thus far been concerned with credences, there's been a recent upsurge in interest in the implications of accuracy for the epistemology of outright belief. All right, so outright belief versus credence is like how much you believe versus just believing, I guess, to core. These accuracy frameworks make use of a formal setting like the following. We model an ideally rational agent's belief B at, as the finite set of propositions that she believes. So we've got a set of propositions, and this is what she believes. When neither P nor not P are in B, we treat our agent as suspending judgment on P. Propositions themselves get modeled as a set of worlds, W, so that proposition, propositional conjunction corresponds to the set intersection, disjunction to set union, entailment to the set subset relation, and so on in the usual way. Okay, um, nothing special really as of yet. Once we have belief sets, we can define accuracy functions A, which give us a precise numerical assessment of how epistemically good or bad B is at some W. In other words, of how accurate our belief set is. Definition one, accuracy function. Okay, math, 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 logic, logic, logic. Informally, what does what A does is count the true beliefs in B at W, count the false beliefs in B at W, and give it gives B a score of T for each true belief and F for each false belief. So let's just see. So oh, all the true beliefs that's the T over here, and all the false beliefs that's the F over here. And so I guess I don't have any idea how this actually makes any sense um, because some truths are more important than other truths and so accounting those things the same um isn't going to uh isn't going to give you an accurate representation of what's important like i can say this uh this paper has the letter e in it and that's true like it uses the letter e like the letter e is right here like you can see that letter e right there it's used there's letter e and that's true. So it's like, I have a true belief now. And then, oh, it has a letter A next to that E right there. And I have, now I have two true beliefs. So, um, there's a question of relevance. So, I, I mean, I'm already a little not with this uh, setup of this sort of uh, accuracy. Because I don't know exactly how you're measuring stuff. Okay. Let's join these theories in making the standard veritist Jamesian assumption that T is greater than zero is greater than F. That is, believing truth is epistemically good while believing falsehoods is epistemically bad. With these epistemic evaluations in place, accuracy theorists then appeal to dominance rules which, when invoked, rule out particular belief sets as irrational. We'll call these global dominance conditions for they require evaluating a belief set at every possible world. Strong global dominance. Alright, so a b prime is greater than a not b prime because regular b at all w in the worlds then b is rationally impermissible so if um b is always less than b prime then you shouldn't be, be believing b when b prime is available okay and weak global dominance 
is that less than or equal to as opposed to strictly less than, then so if it's less than or equal at everywhere and then in some cases B prime is all is better than B, then you do not want to do B because there it's always at least as good as, but never better than, and sometimes worse. Okay. The thought is that being irrational is to adopt a belief set which are guaranteed to do worse than some other at some possible world and never do better at any possible world. This gives us something like a third personal objective evaluation of the belief set. These dominance rules have some attractive properties. As Warren shows that agents who satisfy them will obey single premise closure. I'm going to assume that's Kenny because like Papineau, I just don't know of any other person with that name. As Warren and Feidelson suggest that the rules provide novel treatments of the well-known lottery and preface paradoxes. However, Florian Steinberger, this journal, raises a problem for a, a particular kind of <coughs> accuracy epistemologist, the accuracy monist, who thinks the only epistemic value is accuracy, the stuff represented by the score of the accuracy functions described above. I already worried about that, but yeah, so let's see what this problem is. Steinberger's objection centers on the following sort of case. Coin toss, I toss. Coin. You have to decide whether to believe heads, tails, both or neither. Let us, let WH be the world where the coin lands heads, WT be the world where coin lands tails, so the proposition heads corresponds to the set of worlds with heads, and the spot and the proposition tails corresponds to set of worlds with tails, then our decision tables is as follows. So if you've got both, you've got heads and tails, um, it's true and false. Heads is true when there's heads, false is uh, false when it's tails um, for world heads and world tails otherwise, and then there's the empty set where neither occur. For the accuracy monist who thinks the rational beliefs configure their belief solely set with accuracy in mind, reaction to this case is determined entirely by the values that one gives to T and F. Steinberg Steinberger describes three classes, classes of accuracy function. Epistemic conservatism. No matter what, uh, so absolute F is greater than T. Centrism. T is equal to absolute F. And epistemic radicalism. T is greater than absolute F. So I, all right, so let's just see what um, these mean, because I'm not entirely sure what the uh, bars around the F mean. Epistemic conservatives disvalue false belief more than they value true belief. Okay. Yeah. Epistemic radicals value true belief more than they disvalue false belief. Epistemic centrists attach as much value to true belief as they do to false belief. So a positive true is equal to a, uh, a, a the value of true is equal to the value of false only differs by, in their negation. Um, yeah. And then the, the conservative thinks being wrong is worse than having a right uh, belief in the case and the radical thinks being true is better than it's not so important that if you're false but true is much better okay officially Steinberger's complaint is this it's clear that we should suspend judgments in cases like coin toss well because we don't know what the future is going to bring I guess but epistemic radicals are forbidden from doing so in their light t plus f is greater than zero t plus f is greater than zero meaning that Belief in both heads and tails is strongly, strongly, globally dominates belief in neither. Therefore, the accuracy monist cannot accommodate the judgment that we should suspend because the accuracy monist can give no principled accuracy-centered reason against epistemic, epistemic radicalism, against the prizing of belief, believing truths over failing to believe falsehoods. Okay, so in cases where we intuitively think we should suspend because we the outcomes are equally weighted the radicalist can't do that because they have a non-zero um uh, it's zero sum game here i guess you'd say it's better just to believe something and believe both heads and tails okay steinberger is correct that accuracy must cannot oblige suspension of judgments in cases like this but he but his pointing but his point has nothing to do with epistemic radicalism per se. So long as t is greater than zero is greater than f, making taking a gamble and simply believing one of heads or tails and refraining from believing the other remains globally undominated as the decision table shows. Yeah, so not a terrible thing, just it's a, 
maybe a little worrisome, but not particularly crazy. Once we realize this, the position of epistemic radical looks entirely unsurprising. Yeah. Of course, epistemic radicals should not be suspending judgment on coin tosses and the like, for that is exactly the sort of behavior which is constitutive of epistemic ra radicalism. We ourselves may not find such behavior appealing, but that is simply because we are not epistemic radicals. If we were, we might be more in inclined to join them. Yeah, so if you're just inclined to gamble to begin with, is what kind of what the epistemic radical is, then that's no big deal. And um, it's more of a, uh, if you're, so, question of why would you be an epistemic radical or not, but that's outside the problem here, apparently. The real problem, the one, one that Steinberg Steinberger describes as undergirding our intuitions in favor of conservatism, 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 and therefore suspending judgment, is that head is that epistemic radicals and epistemic centrists are permitted to believe both heads and tails, since no other belief set scores at least as well at every world and better at some. But this combination of attitudes is rationally impermissible, a data point that any adequate epistemic theory must respect. Here. Steinberger's worry is sharp. What accuracy-centered reason can the monist give to rule out centrist or radical endorsed contradictory beliefs? They are stuck. Okay, so they can believe both heads and tails. And so, um, wait, as opposed to ruling it out, let's see. Let's continue. I am persuaded that this is a problem for the accuracy monist. However, I think it can be evaded. When we want our decision theory to respect or avoid some consequence, we typically either modify our value function or our decision rule. In effect, what Steinberger shows is that the accuracy monists are not entitled to rule out certain value functions, but can they appeal to alternative decision rules? I claim they can. Here are a, pair, here are a pair of dominance conditions that are supposed to capture a sort of internal coherence requirement for accuracy accurate believers um okay so strong doxastic dominance so you can't take the intersection <laughs> uh so okay so what are they doing here they'll they'll tell you it looks like they're um at some place where neither is allowed um as opposed to where both you can claim heads and tails they're not they're they're um, all intersections so, as opposed to um, what was up here was, yeah, there is no one that is at all worlds. So they're changing to this all intersection of worlds where B and B prime might hold. Okay. So the, these doxastic dominance conditions encode the thought that accuracy believers avoid being accuracy dominated at all worlds. At all worlds, their beliefs leave open all those worlds which are by their own light possible. So you can't when in those worlds in which you can't have heads and tails. It can has to be one or the other. These conditions are therefore roughly analogous to the to the immodesty condition standardly invoked in creedence accurate in creedal accuracy epistemology. According to immodesty, one's credences must be more accurate in expectation than any others. According to doxastic dominance, one's beliefs must be as accurate as possible in these worlds. The belief set considers live. Being doxastically dominated is irrational then, for roughly the same reason that being modest in the accuracy theorist, theoretic sense is irrational. One is doing epistemolog epistemically badly by one's own lights. Okay, so if you're promoting heads and tails and you're being inaccurate in worlds where you only are allowed to have um, one or the other. So yeah, you have to cull down what you believe because otherwise you're being uh, inaccurate in places where you have to in, in worlds in which you consider that the options are incompatible okie dokie the doxastic dominance, con dominance conditions differ from the global dominance conditions in ignoring what goes on at those worlds which they have ruled out this minor shift ensures that under undominated agents will never have inconsistent beliefs sets so we'll never be permitted to believe both heads and tails. Yeah, so in a world where both heads and tails obtain, it doesn't matter, but in a world where heads and tails cannot both obtain, then you have to choose one. All right, proposition five. If B is inconsistent, then B is strongly doxastically dominated. Okay, proof, suppose B is inconsistent, then the intersection of B is empty, for there is no, no W at which all 
P element to B are true, so B is strongly doxastically dominated since the strong dominance condition is vacuously satisfied. Okay. <coughs> Invoking doxastic dominance and thereby requiring consistency allows the accuracy most to avoid St Steinberger's deep, deeper worry. Yeah, so... Um, let me just double check this thing. Okay, because um, you've got the uh, conditional here. So there is there, this is all sort of empty, so it's true, and then it's impermissible to uh, believe both at that point if it's inconsistent. Okay, so it's vacuously true. Invoking doxas doxas dominance and thereby requiring consistency allows the experts to avoid Steinberger's deeper worry. Rational agents can never believe both heads and tails, regardless of how epistemically radical they are. Admittedly, when one's accuracy function is insufficiently conservative, then suspending judgment remains strongly doxastically dominated by heads or tails, the both condition. But as we've seen, this was never really an issue for epistemic radicals in the first place. The more serious problem has been avoided. Okay, so yeah, I mean, if you're in some sense, you already assume that you're not going to get a uh, an overlap in the outcomes, then you have then uh, in terms of uh, this accuracy norm sort of thing going on here, then you have to pick one. And, uh, okay, so that makes some sense. But you have to already assume that there's something of the, those worlds, of those situations, that you're not going to have an overlapping outcomes of heads and tails. Okay, so we have a plausible dominance condition which precludes contradictory beliefs regardless of whether one is epistemically radical or conservative. We can answer Steinberger's charge without needing to provide accuracy, theoretic, and accu any accuracy theoretic restriction on the class of admissible accuracy functions. What does this mean for the monist? One interesting property of doxastic dominance is that it also requires the set of one's belief to be multi-premise closed. Definition six, multi-premise closure. B is multi-premise closed if and only if uh, B prime is a sub prop as uh, subset or equivalent to B and the intersection of B prime is a subset of P, then P is an element of B. Okay. Sure. All right. So all the stuff that's in B prime have to be in B, if the, under the intersection of B prime. Yeah. Okay. Lemma seven. B is multi premise closed if B is equal to if, if and only if Q and intersection B is subset Q. Okay. Whatever. In other words, B is multi premise closed if if and only if B contains all and only supersets of the intersection of B. That's fine. Proof. We're not going to read proof. Lemma B is consistent. Then uh, B is then all the uh, stuff in B taken together is uh, satisfiable. Um, proof. 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 Okay. And proposition nine: If B is not multi-premise closed, then B is strongly doxastically dominated, because this would be the inconsistent. Um, the inconsistent uh, case, and that would vacuously uh, satisfy the doxastic. This would be then doxastically dominated by the inconsistent argument above. Taken together, these consequences show that to avoid doxastic dominance is to be deductively cogent. For those sympathetic to that norm, this is a happy result. For others, it will be it will be a cost that the accuracy modes cannot treat. The preface and lottery cases in the way Eswarson and Feidelson hoped, where neither consistency nor multi-premise closure were required. Okay, um, so yeah, this is against these folks. Don't know what they had to say though. Is there any way for the monist to tell a story like this? One possibility is requiring that belief sets be doxastically undominated relative to a partition determined by the question at issue without imposing any interpartitional consistency. Um, yeah, I mean, so... This is a good question. What are all these uh, requirements then uh, for the philosophy of monism? All right, accuracy monism. Then in a lottery case, for example, one could believe ticket I will lose relative to the partition ticket I will win, ticket I will lose for all I will not believing that all tickets will lose relative to the partition ticket one will win, all the one ticket N will win. In effect, one thinks 
a particular ticket will lose when considering just it, while not thinking all tickets will lose when considering the entire lottery. Properly explaining how this partition shifting works would require more argument than it has been given here. The lesson for the accuracy bonus is that regardless of whether they want full-blown deductive cogency or some restrictive part partition level rel version, partition relative version of the norm, it is doxastic dominance that offers them a way forward. Okay, so if you're going to play these sorts of uh, logical games with, um, and I don't mean to be putting that down by calling it a game, if you're going to be using these sorts of logical uh, structures to determine how you, uh, your belief, how to interpret beliefs and how you believe, then this is nice because it gives you a... I think it's a little misleading calling it accuracy monism because what it really is is a norm of epistemology, so as they said at the bottom. And how to, uh, I mean, they, I guess they did say that at the beginning. Um, the only, the sole epistemic good is accuracy. Well, I wouldn't call it epistemic good. I wasn't sure, quite sure what that meant up there. It's a sole epistemic norm is accuracy, is trying to be as accurate as possible, and that's what accuracy is the norm of epistemology in the sense that you're trying to get closer and closer to the way the world is and that is what's going on here by um sort of like showing that if some things are true you want to go with the more true things that does run into problems and so what they do is they partition they set they set up the world so that one or the other so your beliefs have to sort of divide out and you can't have uh, situations where two things are equally uh, dominated or equally valued or one that has multiple uh, outcomes is uh, dominates something that has fewer outcomes because then you'd be inaccurate sometimes you'd have like well lots of things can happen well then you're not being accurate you're just being uh, you're just taking all the possibilities which is in some sense not as accurate um, now, the strategy here is to say, look, we're only really considering the worlds or partitions that um, satisfy, that are that really can be broken down in this way. So that is a strong sort of assumption that the way the world is, when accuracy matters, is only matters when the world is the way that it can, that accuracy can uh be effective now most of the time this work <coughs> this works but it's sort of a um metaphysical premise or it, it's not going to be grounded in anything because you're just saying well look we're only really worried about the case in which um like this this sort of accuracy scheme works now the question is, is that begging the question in terms of the accuracy screen uh, scheme because only in times when the accuracy works is when you can make it work no because the argument here was against someone who says you can't make it work and this shows you can make it work now then comes into the question that the author raised at the end who can actually adopt this premise that when this is actually the case that you have worlds in which this sort of thing is when accuracy applies then you can use accuracy but of course who can uh, accept the world as such that accuracy applies so if world if, if it's not a world where accuracy applies then of course it doesn't apply but then you have to make this sort of assumption that accuracy applies um in most in all the worlds that matter now why are those the worlds that matter i don't know but i mean it's at that point if you're talking about a more philosophical question why are the worlds that matter the ones that you don't get heads and tails you can get heads or exclusively tails um so and then so i guess these folks you'd have to sort of talk about accuracy monism plus this extra metaphysical premise um so okay uh a nice paper uh the logic wasn't too heavy-handed here i mean granted i don't I take it this logic here was needed to sort of get the stronger conclusion against the other authors. So you have to do what you got to do to get your good uh, conclusions. And, uh, yep. Yeah.
and so that was good. Other than that, let's see, any comments on the structure of the paper? Um, no, this is reasonably good. I mean, I'm not a, I don't know the literature, so I'm sure it's, would have, uh, I would have figured it out faster if I'd known what was going on, but I think I figured out what was happening fast enough, so it usually means that this was, a uh, well done. Okay, so that's it for now. I hope everyone has a good day, enjoyed this. Uh, send me any suggestions, comments, questions. Always like to hear. Um, other than that, I'll be back later, and uh, have a good day. Stay safe, y'all. Bye.